Hello everybody. As we continue our exploration of the English Romantic writers 1798 to 1832, in this week's lessons we have focused on the politics of the English Romantic writers. We looked at abolitionist poetry, uh, we have touched in passing on the politics of gender and class and race and tyranny and empire, but we have also looked at representations of liberty. In the final session for this week, we shall look at the politics in the poetry of John Clare. John Clare's poetry was devoted to the praise of his immediate geographic and topographic location, Helpston in Northamptonshire. It was also a protest against the socio-economic changes occurring in this particular, what were these? These were included, what were, was happening in the rest of England as well. So, it is not unique to Northamptonshire, enclosure acts, deforestation, social stratification, some amounts of technological intrusion. As recent essays have shown, his description of climate is itself unique in terms of particularities. They focus on very specific uh, issues of concern that have to do with climate in that particular region. Um, here is a small excerpt from Clare's Helpston, which he refers to as dear native spot. And he speaks about the description of the woodman, the axe which has destroyed a tree, as he calls it a tree beheaded or a bush destroyed. Like Wordsworth, Clare also saw the divine in nature. You will recall as we spoke about Wordsworth's environmentalism, his obsessive interest in portraying nature as quasi divine or divine itself. There is an environmental strand in all this, an environmental stance in all this, but it is also uh, something that has been disputed and debated that whether that is the right way to go about environmentalism. We do not want to get into that, but Clare is actually following in the footsteps of William Wordsworth. Here is an instance of Clare's uh, divinization of nature as we can call it, coming up on your screen now. This is from middle period 4, part 4. In these thy haunts I have gleaned habitual love, from the vague world where pride and folly taunts I muse and look above. Thy solitudes, the unbounded heaven esteems, and here my heart warms into higher modes and dignifying dreams. I see the sky, smile on the meanest spot, giving to all that creep or walk or fly a calm and cordial lot. Thine teaches me right feelings to employ, that in the dreariest places peace will be a dweller and a joy. Claire rejected the transformation of nature into objects entirely evaluated in terms of their human value. Uh, what does that mean? What he is saying is, you cannot see nature via an instrumentalist perspective. What can nature do for the humans? This instrumentalist, instrumental perspective is what many environmentalists say causes our damaging of nature. We see nature as a resource to be exploited, to take from nature whatever we need for our home, for our industry, for our cities, for our civilization in general. The instrumental view of nature means nature is subordinated to human nature, to human needs and human requirements. For Claire, there is a problem as there is a problem for other environmentalists as well. We do not see nature as having any intrinsic value. We see nature as having value only for us. And Claire traced the destruction of nature as a result of this um, instrumentalization or instrumental view uh, due to the landlords and their enclosures. He emphatically absolved the poorer farmers and the laborers from this ethos of destruction and is the principal poet of the anti-enclosure sentiment. Here is a description that best captures, I think, the question of the landlord's role. But sweating slaves I do not blame. Those slaves by wealth decreed know I should hurt their harmless name to brand them with the deed, although their aching hands did wield the axe that gave the blow. Yet was not them that owned the field nor planned its overthrow. Look at what he is saying. The slave who wields the axe, who chops up the trees or levels the land is not to blame the, because the slave does not own the land. Claire is linking two things, the instrumental view of nature and the question of property. That people who own nature as property are not seeing it except as something that exists to serve them. So, as he says, it was not them that owned the field, nor was it the slave that planned its overthrow. Claire saw human actions, such as the enclosure acts, as creating deserts. And the peasant poet here in the next slide is actually Claire's persona. Here it is. There once were days, the woodsman knows it well, when shades in echoed with the singing thrush. 
there are ones where ours the plowman's tale can tell, where morning's beauty wore its earliest blush, how woodlarks caroled from each stumpy bush. Lubin himself has marked them sore and sing, the thorns are gone, the woodlark's song is hush. Spring more resembles winter now than spring. The shades are banished all, the birds have took to wing. By Langley bush I roam, but the bush hath left its hill. On Cooper green I stray, tis a desert strange and chill, and spreading lee close, oak ere decay had penned its will to the axe of the spoiler and self-interest fell a prey. Note that description, to the axe of the spoiler and self-interest. He's speaking about humans, of course, whose self-interest uh, trumps everything else and so on. And then he will say, um, I shall never again see, never see again enclosure like a Bonaparte. Let not a thing remain. It leveled every bush and tree and leveled every hill and hung the moles for traitors, or, though the brook is running still, it runs a naked brook, cold and chill. Continuing, another poem, The Moors. On paths to freedom and to childhood dear, a board sticks up to notice, no road here. Our, let's spend a couple of seconds on this. What is Claire doing? Claire is saying, on paths to freedom and to childhood dear, a board sticks up and it's a notice which says, no road here. What he's saying is, it used to be a common land, it used to be common pathways and common roads. Suddenly, there is a notice which says, there is no longer a road here. It is literally the privatization of land. That, and I'm sure if you're reading the newspapers across uh, India, uh, you will see these descriptions of what used to be a common road has been taken away by a cantonment, uh, an organization, it has been privatized. In fact, if you think carefully, what Claire is talking about here is what you see in urban cities now. The mall, for example, is the street taken in. As urban studies scholars of shopping such as Sharon Zukin have argued, the mall takes in the street. So previously you used to walk down a street to shop. Now you enter a building to shop because the street has gone inside. That's what Claire is saying, no road here. Suddenly, everything has changed. And as, if you look at the conclusion of those lines, he says, uh, and birds and trees and flowers without a name, all sighed when lawless laws enclosure came. Claire, if you notice, uh, likens enclosure to Napoleon. This is greed, this is conquest, and this nostalgia for the land lost to human greed. He says in the Morse, unbounded freedom ruled the wandering scene. Unbounded freedom. Boundary is not about freedom alone. Boundary is actually in um, Claire's account, the boundaries or fences around fields. Unbounded freedom ruled the wandering scene. Again, you could wander without restriction. And I would urge you to recall here a connection. The description in Blake's London of chartered streets and the chartered river Thames. Chartered meaning they have been sanctioned off as private property. You require a, uh, an order to be allowed to go through it. They have been organized in a dif different way. Look at what he's saying. Unbounded freedom ruled the wandering scene, nor fence of ownership crept in between. To hide the prospect of the falling eye, the, the land flows. Its only bondage was the circling sky. There's nothing else. The, it's unbounded. Your vision and your mobility are both endless. John Burnside argues that the invocation of the circling sky and the horizon's edge echoes the sense of the sky and air as a source of imaginative freedom. It's an innovative reading. So what Burnside is arguing is the description of vast seas and horizon actually is about imaginative freedom itself. In terms of environmental politics, Claire extends his respect for all life forms and the land itself. He's very visionary in that sense. For example, here is the famous poem, The Lament of Saudi Well. And he says, uh, he's looking at different forms of life itself. Please look at the excerpt on your screen, where he is speaking about different forms of life. And he says at the end, my only tree, they have left a stump. That's all there is, it has been chopped and chopped and chopped. And not remains my own, nothing remains my own. As in there's nothing which is my own uh, tree as such. Claire is seen as a proto-Marxist for his political views um, on community, and land. John Burnside uh, has also marked him as the forerunner of some of today's dissidents, including those in the Occupy movement due to poems such as The Tramp. Um, in this poem, which is now up on your slide, he's talking about people who are quote unquote 
illegitimate occupants of a particular area, that they are not supposed to be there, but they are there. So Burnside's innovative reading says that the, uh, some of you may recall the Occupy movement, Occupy Wall Street is what he's referring to. Um, the students and those protesting against globalization or capitalism went and occupied those places which were associated with high finance, which the world of, uh, with the world of high capitalism. And uh, Burnside argues that poems like The Tramp are actually um, anticipating uh, the arrival of the um, uh, Occupy protests, where the tramp is where he ought not to be. He stops where he should not stop. John Clare is not a very anthologized writer for some peculiar reason. But there's a lot in John Clare that teaches us about several things, such as environmentalism, for one, and the politics of community enclosures and the social hierarchies that determine our use of the land itself. So reading Clare means we understand environment, social hierarchy, and proto capitalist uh, situations in England itself. The link between the arrival of the industrialist, uh, attitude towards the land, and what happens to environmental thinking in itself. Thank you.